as we come to the end of the book of Acts, we uh, get the sense that the ending of Acts ends on a low note. We find the apostle to the Gentiles in chains. It's a rather underwhelming picture, isn't it? Of gospel advance, of finding one of the premier apostles bound and led to Caesar. In Luke's corpus, in Luke and Acts, both, we have seen the gospel on trial before secular authorities. In Luke chapter 2, we're introduced to Caesar Augustus. Acts 28 ends with Paul heading to Caesar's palace. But we must not read the book of Acts and the ending of Acts through a pessimistic lens. The contrast here is intentional. Once more, the gospel and its messenger will be put on trial by the rulers of this world. But transcending the rulers of this world is the risen and ascended Christ who sits over his church. The King of kings and the Lord of lords who's seated on his throne, who's advancing the gospel in spite of chains. And we could argue this morning even through the chains that Paul is bound in. And so although the servants of Christ might be chained for the sake of the gospel, though we might face that very real possibility ourselves for preaching the gospel, our gaze this morning needs to be lifted up to Christ. That's where Luke would have us end as Paul is preaching the kingdom of God and persuading concerning Jesus. We need to be focused on the ascended Christ who uses these chains and hardships to demonstrate that his word cannot be bound. At key points in the book of Acts, we read this statement, the word of God grew. Luke doesn't use that statement at the end of Acts, and yet we get the sense that the word of the Lord is growing in spite of its messenger being chained. Our theme for this chapel message is chained servant, unchained gospel. Our first thought is a chained servant of hope. Our second thought is an unchained gospel to the nations. And so Paul is brought to Rome in chains, brought to a private home in Rome, chained to a Roman guard, does Paul sit still and bemoan his fate? Does he look at his chains and say, look at these chains, how awful it is to be chained? No. He calls the Jews, he calls for them to see them and to speak with them. He has a message. His, his heart is burning, as it were, with this, this gospel message that is bound up, similar to Ezekiel, as we heard last week. He ate the scroll. And it was sweet to him. And it's that message that's bound up in Paul's own heart. And so he does not bemoan his fate. He does not stare at his chains. But front and center is his desire not to maintain his innocence in the first place, though he does that, but to evangelize his fellow Jews. And so in verses 17 through 19, he appeals to the Jews in Rome, men and brethren, though I have committed nothing against the people or customs of our fathers, Yet was I delivered prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans, who, when they had examined me, would have let me go, because there was no cause of death in me. But when the Jews spake against it, I was constrained to appeal unto Caesar, not that I had ought to accuse my nation of. You see, Paul had been upholding the law up until this point, even going to the extent of keeping the ceremonial law for some of the brothers in Jerusalem, and the things that ultimately did not matter. There was nothing that the Jews could accuse him of, but they withstood him at every turn. They hated him and they hated the Christ that he served. But here it would appear that Paul simply declaring his innocence. But then as we get to verse 20, we see the nub of the issue exposed. For this cause, therefore, have I called for you to see you and to speak with you. Because for the hope of Israel, I am bound with this chain. Think about that for a moment, what Paul is saying here. For the hope of Israel, 
I am bound with just this chain. Seems to be a counterintuitive response to being bound with chains. But for Paul, these very chains are a visible reminder of the truth of the gospel that has brought him to Rome, that has brought him to this place. It's because he has been proclaiming the gospel to this point, and he will continue as long as he has breath to proclaim the gospel. It's for the hope of Israel that I am chained. How can Paul maintain a positive view of his chains? Well, we know he didn't sign up to be chained. He didn't walk into the the office of the Roman Praetorium and say, here I am, just chain me and, and take me to Rome. That's not what he did. He's chained because he was preaching the gospel because his own fellow countrymen were coming against him and yet he's, he's impelled to call them together so that he might speak to them of the hope of Israel. He's chained and as he's chained, he sees this as an opportunity to preach the unfettered gospel, the unchained gospel. In Ephesians 6, 19 and 20, we see Paul's perspective on his bonds. He asks the Ephesian church to pray for him that he might have boldness and utterance as an ambassador of the gospel in bonds. He wasn't crying. He wasn't sitting there with his own pity party. He was asking the church to pray for him to have boldness that though he was bound for the sake of the gospel, he might have more boldness and confidence to preach. In Philippians 1, Paul desires that his chains serve as a means for the the furtherance of the gospel. And we read there that these chains become the source of encouragement and emboldening for others to preach the gospel. In Colossians 4, 3, he again requests prayer from the Colossians for boldness because he's chained for the mystery of Christ. And then we read Paul's perspective in 2 Timothy 2, verses 8 through 10. That brings these things together, his being chained as a chained servant of hope and an unchained gospel that he proclaims. He says, remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. Wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds, but the word of God is not bound. Therefore, I endure all things for the elect's sakes, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. This is the climax of Paul's view of his chains. I'm chained, but the word isn't. The word of God increases in spite of his chains. The gospel advances because of the opposition. Rather than pine away and pity himself, Paul sees his chains as an opportunity to preach, to proclaim the hope of Israel to his fellow countrymen that had put him in chains. And so we see here the heart of Paul the evangelist. His heart beats with love for his fellow countrymen who walked in the hopelessness of ritual and self-righteousness, blinded to the reality of hope that was couched in the person and the work of Christ. What Paul is saying to these Jews that stand before him in prison in Rome is that everything they had longed for, everything that they had looked for in anticipation in the Messiah is represented behind these chains. Paul himself is testament, is witness to the fact that this word is the hope of Israel, that the Christ is the hope of Israel. He's brought back, as it were, to the Damascus Road, where Christ appeared to him in due time and took him and freed him from the religious bondage of Pharisaism, of self-righteousness, of works religion, of persecuting Christ himself. So Paul stands before the Jews, chained. But he's saying, I'm freer than any one of you even though I'm in chains, free because of the hope of Israel, free because of Christ. Brothers and sisters, this is the perspective we need in times of hardship, in times of persecution, and increasing opposition to the gospel. 
Let's not pity ourselves. Let's not bemoan our fate, but let's see this as an opportunity to preach the gospel. Many of the chapels this semester have focused on the increasing tide of evil and opposition to the gospel. But here we see Paul responding in a Christ-exalting way to his bonds, to his persecution. We might face chains eventually. Or the very real threat of chains for, for those of you who go back to your countries where there is open persecution of the servants of Christ. But as we face these realities, let us always remember that as we bring the gospel, the hope of the gospel, the hope of Israel in Christ Jesus can never be chained. We use times of opposition. We use our chains, our bonds, our hardships as opportunities, recognizing that the word of God is not bound, recognizing that our hardships come about as a result of following after Christ as part of the cross that we are called to, to take up and to follow him. Well, the Jews respond to Paul's statement about his innocence and his chains in verse 21. But we desire to hear of thee what thou thinkest. For as concerning this sect, we know that everywhere it is spoken against. Perhaps curiosity has driven them to this point. They want, they want Paul's opinion regarding Christianity as a sect. It's interesting that the word that's used there is heresy in the Greek. What Paul calls gospel hope, the unbeliever looks at and calls heresy. As these Jews speak about Christianity, they build an unintentional contrast regarding the gospel. Will they choose hope or will they choose heresy? That's really the great divide, isn't it? The gospel is the hope for those who are hopeless in themselves, for those who turn to Christ for salvation. But to the unbelieving heart, the gospel is viewed as, as heresy, as a sect to be rejected or a sect to be curiously inquired about, but not a person to be embraced with a warm, living faith. And it's this divide we see coming and apparent in our culture. We can no longer hide and be comfortable as cultural Christians, but the gospel and even the culture itself is, is now calling us to take sides. How will we view Christ and the gospel? How will we view Christianity as the only hope for salvation or as a heresy to be rejected because it opposes the woke philosophies of the world? Brothers and sisters, we're not immune to this. We are weak, frail human beings. Let us remember that the gospel is hope, not heresy. As we stand in the pulpits on Sunday, how, what are we presenting? Are we presenting a weak, anemic gospel that cannot save people, that can only uh, lead to self-help? Or are we preaching the hope of Israel, pointing to Christ as the only hope and salvation for sinners? Or do we speak in platitudes and present Christianity as something to be inquired after as a, as a philosophy on par with the rest of the philosophies of the world? Or do we show it as a true pursuit of wisdom of Christ himself? That leads us to see a mixed response to the gospel. Under our second thought, an unchained gospel of hope. Paul is handed an opportunity to preach to his fellow countrymen. This was not only his strategy to the Jew first, but it's also an expression of love for the souls of his fellow countrymen, as he writes in Romans 9, verses 2 and 3, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart, for I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh. So it's more than just a missionary strategy that Paul employed here. It's an expression of his desire to see the Jews come to the hope of Israel. In verse 23, they come to him to hear what he has to say. And what does he say? To whom he expounded 
and testified the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets from morning till evening. Paul preaches to them the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God that is broken in through the coming of Christ, the anointed one, the Mashiach. It was not an earthly kingdom that the Jews sought for from Roman oppression. It was a spiritual kingdom that gradually expanded through the preaching of Christ. Paul expounded to them the kingdom. He explained and witnessed to them about the kingdom. He stood there as God's mouthpiece, as a divine witness to the Jews that stood in front of him, leaving them without excuse as he preached the gospel of the kingdom. He built a case for the kingdom of God. And then, too, he persuaded. Paul adds here an emotional appeal from the scriptures to his fellow Jews regarding the person and work of Christ. What was the foundation for his message? It was the scriptures. None other than Moses and the prophets. There's no need for lofty language or rhetoric in preaching. There's no need for tricks and gimmicks. We need to remember these three key words of gospel preaching as Paul preaches to the Jews. As he is bound, he expounds, he testifies, he witnesses as a divine witness, and he persuades. He is the ambassador in bonds to the Jews of the hope of Israel. Brothers, specifically this morning, this sums up your and my task as we preach the gospel grounded in the revelation of God alone. The ending of Acts is similar to the ending of Luke, isn't it? How did Jesus speak to them, the, the travelers to Emmaus? He explained to them Moses and the prophets, and here we find Paul walking in the footsteps of, of his master, preaching from Moses and the prophets to the Jews, the gospel of the kingdom. But then Paul is faced with the reality of the response to his preaching, something that we're called to grapple with as well as ministers of the gospel. In verse 24, there's a mixed response, as there always is to the preaching of the gospel. Some believed the things which were spoken and some believed not. Some were persuaded by the words of Paul. Others continued on in unbelief. On that day, the gospel brought life to some and hardened others. And Luke helps us make sense of the response to the gospel in terms of God's sovereignty and human responsibility. How do we explain this mixed reaction? Why would Paul's preaching be met with a mixed reaction? Wouldn't God use that message to save all of the Jews in front of him? And what about preaching today? Why is there a mixed response to the gospel as we preach? Should we fault God for those who do not believe the gospel? Or if we do not believe the gospel ourselves, no, we can never fault God. The offer of the gospel is well meant and offered to all sinners. In the words of the canons of Dort, promiscuously and without distinction. The fault is not with the message or with God. Should we fault the messenger who brings the gospel? Well, we could say a very qualified yes, depending on the circumstances. Should we fault the gospel itself? No, because Paul writes in Romans, the, the gospel is the power of God into salvation to those who believe. There's, there's an inherent power in the gospel. It's not the gospel's fault either. So who should we fault if we do not believe? Or if we meet the reaction of unbelief in our audience? Listen to where Paul places the responsibility for unbelief. He goes back to Isaiah. Isaiah 6, verses 9 and 10. Well spake the Holy Ghost by Isaiah the prophet unto our fathers, saying, Go unto this people and say, Hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand. And seeing ye shall see, and not perceive, for the heart of this people is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have they closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. What's going on in these verses? 
Isaiah is told by God to go to Israel. His ministry to them would be ineffective in terms of producing the fruit of faith. Now, who would want to go on such a mission? Paul saw himself in that light to the Jews as well. This passage points out in the words of Archibald Alexander three aspects of agency that contribute to God's judgment on Israel. There's the ministerial agency of the prophet through the preaching. There's the judicial agency of God, the hardening. And then there's the suicidal agency of the people themselves of unbelief. And so the gospel comes with a massive responsibility, doesn't it? To those who hear it and to those who preach it, including us this morning. Paul appeals to the Jews with these verses, highlighting their folly at turning away from God. He highlights their suicidal agency. He points to their fathers and calls them to turn to God and to be healed. So where does the responsibility lie for rejection to the gospel? It lies with those who hear. It's a sobering message. But it's also a hopeful message. Because these words are written for our warning, for the church's warning, for those to whom we preach, that they will turn to the Lord and be healed. Because the gospel is not chained. The gospel has the power to change hearts and minds and unite sinners to Christ, ultimately. And so we see this unchained gospel. On the one hand, it produces the effects of hardening, a mixed response. And yet we see that the gospel will advance. It's not chained. It's not bound. It will go forth to the nations. Paul writes in Romans 1.16, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, the power of God into salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. It's unchained with power for the nations. It's for the hope of Israel, but it's now also for the salvation of the Gentiles, as Paul says in verse 28. Be it known therefore unto you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles, and they will hear it. The preaching of Paul to the Jews is an indictment on their unbelief. The spreading of the gospel to the Gentiles. The suicidal rejection of the gospel on the part of the Jews leads to life for the Gentiles. And this movement is of, of the gospel from the Jew to the Gentile is central to, to Paul's theology. You only have to read Romans 9 through 11. And this is operating behind Paul's statement here in Acts. It speaks to God's saving purposes. It speaks to Paul's mission in bringing the gospel, even though he is bound. It's as he's bound that the word of God pivots from the Jew to the Gentile, from the Jew to all nations of the world. The gospel is unchained as this chained servant proclaims it in a Roman prison. Verses 30 and 31, Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house, received all that came in unto him, preaching the kingdom of God, teaching those things concerning the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him. A chained servant, but an unchained gospel. What a beautiful presentation of Christ these last verses of Acts are for us this morning. Demonstrating again the heart of the master. Paul received all that came in unto him. This should mark our ministry as it marked the ministry of the apostle Paul. Even as he's bound, he received all who came in unto him. How much more Christ is the same for those who are hungering and thirsting for truth and righteousness. But we demonstrate the heart of the master as we, as we minister to those who are hungering for truth, for righteousness.
Paul preached the kingdom of God. He taught his hearers to look beyond this world to the world and the kingdom that was already breaking in with the coming of Christ. He lifted their eyes up from an earthly kingdom to a weak and broken king, to a everlasting kingdom, to a king upon the throne. And that's what we're called to do as well, to direct the, eye, the eyes and ears of those to whom we preach, to view the king on the throne, who's going to come again and to establish his forever kingdom in the hearts of sinners and then roll everything together to judgment and the glorious reign of Messiah from sea to a shining sea. You see, the gospel is unchained to the nation so that Christ might rule over the nations. That's why Paul is an ambassador in bonds for his king. That's who we are as we preach the gospel to the nations. Paul taught them those things concerning Jesus Christ. He held nothing back regarding the Messiah. Let's hold nothing back when we preach. Nothing concerning Christ. Let's preach him to the max, to the full, even if we're chained. Let our chains not be a hindrance, but be an opportunity to hold nothing back. The gospel is unchained. As Paul preaches and as we preach, Christ is released, as it were, from the shadows of the Old Testament and set forth in the glories of the new. He's unparalleled in the new heavens and the new earth as the focal point of the praise of all nations for his redeeming work. This is the Christ. This is the Messiah that Paul preached. This is the Messiah that you and I are called to preach. And how? With all confidence. With all spirit worked boldness. No one forbade him. No ruler, no governor, no family member, no Jew, no Gentile could hinder the gospel from being unchained and sent to the nations in the center of the Roman Empire. We don't read of Paul's trial. We don't read of Paul's death. But we read of Paul gladly proclaiming his Savior to the nations as the hope of Israel, as the hope of the Gentiles. And so, in a sense, we face an unfinished task. The task is not yet done. The servants of Christ may be bound. We may face persecution. We may face hardship and trials. But we need to remember that the word of God is not bound. The gospel is unchained. That is our task is to proclaim an unchained gospel of a glorious, risen, and ascended Christ who's expanding his kingdom, who's building his church, who's saving the lost for his glory. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we pray that you will bless these words, that we would go forth encouraged, emboldened to preach Christ and him crucified, holding nothing back of the person of Christ, but preaching the kingdom, persuading, testifying, witnessing, not to be discouraged at the response of unbelief, but to see it as a suicidal agency of those who do not believe, that that would impel us with greater desire to preach the gospel, knowing that there are those who need to hear it, and that you have sent us out as chained servants of the hope of Israel. May we see ourselves as such this morning, and go forth with all boldness and spirit-worked confidence. We do ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.